Hello, everyone, and welcome to Trashy Divorces. Thanks for joining us. I'm Alicia. My name is Stacy. We're excited that you're here. Relax. We're always excited Take that a load you're off. here. Thank you so much for being here. There's a lot going on, and we appreciate you taking a little break with us today. We have two amazing. We do not Al- even trashy almost stories. off brand. Yeah, almost entirely off brand stories for you. We shot. We didn't score. No, we have some <laughs> great really happy stories, stories today. We were starting this one out, calling it Are You Gonna Go My Way, but then ended up changing it in the middle of your story to Let Love Rule. Yep. Great song by Lenny Kravitz, mm-hmm. who is part of your My story, yep. this week. I am covering Lisa Bonet and Lenny Kravitz and their six-year-long marriage, I believe. Produced, amazing. Produced daughter Zoe Kravitz, who is going to be the most famous person of all time, if you ask me. But Pretty sure. We're pretty convinced of that. Yeah. And you have a legend... An icon. An icon. Jane Fonda, Trashy Divorces All-Star, this week with just a story that I I love it all. So, before we get to our Trashy Divorces for the week, we're going to pull out the magic mirror. Yes, we are. And I have a very special guest in our magic mirror this week. It is our friend Esther, who, for her sophomore term paper, end of the year final... Guess what she wrote about? She wrote about trashy divorces. And she made an A. And she made an A. She sent it to us. Esther, big shout out to you. Yeah, that was a highlight of the week for sure. Thank you, Esther. You are awesome. And thank you, Esther's teacher. Oh, yeah. Thanks, (laughs) Esther's teacher. We appreciated the A. Uh, We like it. And if you're listening to Trashy Divorces this week, welcome. We're excited to have you in the Trash Panda Club. Okay. But we still have the magic mirror out. We had a bunch of people join us on Patreon this week. We did, yes. Uh, we would like to give huge, huge shout outs and thank yous to Elizabeth F., Paula K., Heather T., Amy, Tonda W., Kelsey K., Michelle H., Taylor C., Olivia A., Jill L., Emily R., Marie R., Lisa O., Heather, Amanda F., Daniel K., Jodel K., Bree, Joanne S., Y'all are amazing. We have some super supporters, too. Holy cats. Two new super supporters, Christine I and JJ Lachavre. And whoa, Olivia W. somehow made her own level on we, Patreon this week. Yeah, we don't know how that as works. As a but, super, super supporter. But thank you. Olivia W., you rock. Y'all, if you want to get more trash candy in the meantime, in between Sunday episodes... You can always check out, we've got a bunch of free trash candy up Mm -hmm. at bit.ly slash trash candy quarantine. And again, I'm so sorry I made that such a long (laughs) short link. That's the longest short link in the world. And we're putting new content out every week. I positively had a fangirl gush. You found my fangirl fandom this week. Uh Uh-huh. Did a yep. double length episode on candy candy spelling. spelling with a fun with done connection. We talked about opposing signs. Thank you, new supporters. Thank you, existing supporters. Thank you, y'all. Yeah, thanks for, for coming to share in the trash candy pool of goodness with us for this week. It really is a fun week. You ready to let love rule? Let's let love rule because why not just be off brand? Go, go, go. <laughs> All right, Alicia, I'm really excited for your story this week because. I'm an army brat, and I was raised in a household where Jane Fonda was not popular. Let's put it that way. And so I didn't even really learn about her as a human being and as an activist and as really even as an actor until I was an adult. So I'm I'm all ears. I can't wait to tell you this story. I've called this Jane Fonda whole goddess. <gasps> She's so good. <laughs> Jane Fonda is a December 21st baby. So technically a Sagittarius, but also within that wonderful time period of December 19th to December 24th, which for most of our Christmas winter holiday born babies sometimes typically can suck. But what is good for them, those December 19th to December 24th babies, they are born in the Sagittarius Capricorn cusp, which is known as the cusp of prophecy. Okay. It is one of the I most... I swear to God you make these up. Okay, go ahead. No, it's the I cusp know. of prophecy. Okay. This is one of the most distinct and powerful cup crossings. 
I have a little cusp follow up cup, on cup crossings or cusp cross- cusp. Did I say cups? Jeez. You say cup crossing. God, it's even written the right way too. Okay. The cusp of prophecy is one of the most distinct and powerful cusp crossings. That's your Sally went to the seashore tongue twister right there. Okay. So this happens around the time of the winter solstice. So it's the Mm. darkest moment of the year, but light returning again. This uh, cusp of prophecy. It's the balance of hope and strength. You have the easygoingness of of the Sagittarius. And the determination of the goat. It's a fascinating little time period. Jane Fonda is going to be married (laughs) three times in her life. I would say so far. But Jane has been pretty vocal in her third act. The last. Yeah. Decant of her life. Mm -hmm. uh, About never doing that again. So. I'm going to go ahead and put her up to be a Trashy Divorces All-Star. Even though she only has three, I don't think we're getting any more. <laughs> Each of Jane's husbands are very different, but so was Jane. Jane was a very different person in each of these marriages. And we have watched through 80 years of a life, Jane evolve. Like she's born famous. She's a member of a leading Hollywood dynasty. She's a Broadway actress. She's an international film star. She's a relentless political activist. Oh, fitness entrepreneur. Remember all of her exercise videos? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. She's an author too. There's this amazing masterclass that Oprah has done where it's uh, make your life a lesson. And so all kinds of famous people come and talk And Jane Fonda's is one of the most profound to me. I think about it literally every day. This one line that she said from this, it's not about being perfect. It's about being whole. Hmm. It's not about being perfect. It's about being whole. And at 62, Jane is going to decide to get whole. No man on her own decides that she is going to undertake this calling not to be perfect but to be whole. So to me, she's a trashy divorces all-star just for the lessons that she can give us all on that quest for being whole and not perfect. Cause really like, don't we all strive for perfect in a thousand ways and empty out? I've done it to a hollow shell of ourselves to achieve something that you think other people think is perfect. And then you forget who you are. I don't know. Okay. How does Jane do it? And how do her trashy divorces help get her there? Jane Fonda is named after one of her very famous relatives, the third wife of Henry VIII, Jane Seymour. Really? Queen Jane Seymour. Yes, ma'am. Wow. One of her, this is one of her relatives. Yes. Jane's mom is a socialite and has Seymour in her last name. She is Frances Ford Seymour Brokaw. Her mom is a, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and Jane's dad is, well, <laughs> Henry Fonda. Sure, sure. So this is not Jane's childhood podcast, so I'm going to do a quick sure. sum up here because three trashy divorces to get to. Dad is distant. Mom is suffering her own battles that Jane will not fully become aware of until Jane is an adult and gets mom's records from the institution where mom was. It's messy. Mom is institutionalized manic depression bipolar like the terms change and her mom will commit suicide when jane is 12 yikes and this will begin jane's descent into kind of fractured right like that is it oh yeah there's no way around that yeah because there's not a lot of family support there's not a lot of openness jane and her brother aren't told how mom dies it's mm-hmm. just, mm-hmm. I, it, it uh. so Jane takes a lot of this guilt on herself because her mom, this, uh, this is tragic. Mom comes home from the institution and Jane and her brother are playing upstairs and they're like, come on, come see your mom. And Jane doesn't go. But mom came home from the institution to get a razor blade so she could take it back to the institution and 
right? So Jane holds all of this guilt. It, it is a yeah, it, horribly trauma. sad, trauma. traumatic, right? So Jane is going to suffer from depression, eating disorders, and. Like so many kids do in this kind of state, how can I be perfect for you? Right? Emotionally distant dad who is now remarried. She likes her stepmom. But she ends up like, she didn't, never really wants to be an actress. But I guess she's like, oh, okay. So her friend Susan Strasberg is like, yeah, I should come to my dad's classes. And so Jane does. And Marilyn Monroe is in her class. And Jane recalls like being very shy. Very in the back, not wanting to go do anything. But she finally does one day. And Lee Strasberg compliments her. And she's like, from that moment on, New York changed. Hmm. I went to bed loving something. I woke up loving something. I had oh, wow. a kind of a different direction. I mean, you have, right? Mm -hmm. Older, wizened guy, kind of in her dad's, but like, hey, you're, you're good at this. Keep doing it. Right, right. She just needed a little encouragement. Jane is going to meet her first husband, Roger Vadim, born January 26th. He's an Aquarius, baby. He has a French mother, a Russian father. Dad's a diplomat, so there's lots of travel. And much like Jane's early childhood, Roger's father dies when he is nine. So he has that early parent death connection as well, even though he's like 10 years older than Jane. Roger lands in Paris. He's writing... He uh, has been married a few times. He's becoming a notorious lover about town. Okay, for real. I have a whole Roger Vadim follow-up this week for Patreon on Wednesday because it is trashy. But by 1963, when Jane and Roger meet, Roger has divorced Bridget Bardot. Wow. His new protege that he turned into Bridget Bardot, Annette Stroyberg, he's divorced her and is carrying on a hopeless love affair with Catherine Deneuve that has ended because Annette, his second wife, is like, you marry Catherine Deneuve and I'm taking our child away from you. Oh, wow. So it's, I mean, this is coming up on Wednesday. I'm, uh, it's so good. Okay. But I'm focusing right. on the Jane part. Okay. So, In Walks Jane, 1963. Uh, Roger, and he and Catherine Deneuve, whoa, they never get married, but they have this contentious relationship like they it's one of those can't live with you can't live without you kind of things so 1963 jane is headed to paris to star in a movie and she kind of becomes like the new bridget bardot she's this overnight celebrity and she does not speak french and jane is like crippling shy and like terrified and like what the hell but the press start following her because her French is so colloquial and weird and funny and she becomes this superstar she's befriended by Simone Signore Yves Montan the French press is going mad about comparing her she's the new Bridget Bardot even though they're very different Jane's French agent is going to throw her a birthday party because her Birthday, December 21st. Oh, She's right. in Paris with one guest, the notorious film director, Roger Vadim. And Jane's captivated. And so is Roger. Oh, God. Okay. Like, he literally threw a party for her with one guest. Mm -hmm. So it was a. Well, Roger has a role a and date. he wants Jane to take it. Yeah, okay. So they're. He, okay. Yeah. Okay. So this affair is HOT. Jane is awakened sexually like for the first time it is oh, hot and jane is like Psh, sure i'll take your movie and i'll get a place in paris and she does and roger moves in and it's bliss in the beginning because right we're bunnies that's that's yeah, what we yeah, do yeah. in paris for the first few months we're together sure. and then reality begins to set in and then they realize they're very different people and jane likes to go to bed early and Roger likes to drink late in bars and talk loud. And she thinks his life is just messy and nonchalant. He'll leave dishes stacked up in this. Like they are, could not be more, a, more different. Aquarius cusp of pro, like there could not be more different. Okay. 
There's also this BFF that Roger has. His name is Christian Marquand. And they have a lot of uh, Hemingway Fitzgerald in your window between them. Like, it's the same. They mm. each name kids after each other. Mm. There's a lot of gay postcards. But it's a swing in 60s. And uh, sure. Jane will star in Roger's movie, and it's everything. And it's Paris and hot sex. And he wants to make Jane his new star, just like he has done with Bridget Bardot and Annette and Catherine. Like, this is, he's a, he's a star maker. Okay. Because they'll do this with everybody. But there's this one day on set that Roger falls and like breaks his arm and all four of these lovers, Jane, Catherine Deneuve, Annette and Bridget Bardot within 10 minutes have arrived. The ambulance has not even arrived yet to take him to hospital and all four of his lovers past and present oh my God. are there to get in with him to go to the ambulance. And they all like have this shared moment of, you know, laughter between them that, well, because, uh, I think it was Bridget Bardot, like, kind of makes kind of a diss on him. And they all, like, because they know him. Yeah. They know him. Oh, yeah. They know him intimately. Apparently, they love him. So, Jane from 63 to 65 is like a perfect mistress. She's mothering his children. Jane is going to get Roger's finances in order. Jane, when she gets an inheritance from her mother, about $150,000, Jane will... (laughs) Share it with Roger, who Jane later finds out all of it is blown on his gambling addiction that she doesn't know he has. And it's going to take her five years, but she's going to pay off his debts. So people say he's using her, but Jane's like, "Mm, maybe I'm using him in this journey of finding myself. So they will buy a farmhouse. Jane will buy a farmhouse 37 miles from Paris spend three years renovating it. They collect a veritable zoo. They have ducks and rabbits and kittens and dogs and a life of trips and filming and whirlwind adventures. And he's directing her on screen and off screen too. Because Roger believes in sexual freedom. I want you to put that in quotes. (laughs) So he really likes the sexual freedom and needs to be directing all the time whether it is Jane in life or Jane in bed. So like rumors are flying around that Jane Fonda is gay or bisexual. And she will say once, look, can't we leave something to the imagination? Frankly, I've probably done everything, but I will never write about my sex life unless I write about it in a novel. Hmm. Okay. So she and Roger, we're coming up on some more dirt here. There's traveling back and forth to the States and, Things are kind of a little bit shaky and they're leaving and getting together. And you know what'll fix any problem that we're having? A baby? No, let's get married. Oh, oh, sorry. They had not done that yet. They haven't gotten married Mm. yet. So I jumped ahead. (laughs) So close. To the the second way to fix your failed marriage. (laughs) The first way to fix your your failed relationship. Definitely get married. Definitely get married. Definitely tie yourself to the other person. So Roger and Jane do. August 14th, 1965. Little Leo wedding. (laughs) In a private ceremony at the Dunes Hotel in Las Vegas. Jane's brother Peter and his wife Susan are there. Jane's friend Brooke Hayward, who is currently married to Dennis Hopper at the time, are there. Oh, yeah. Christian Marquand, the... Right. The possible lover. BFF possible lover is there with his (laughs) wife, too. That's always good fortune when... (laughs) Oh, no. You don't even know. So, Roger doesn't have a ring. So Jane will use the ring from Christian's wife, who's oh, there. Oh, no, that's too and close. And it's too big and too awkward. So it looks like Jane is, like, flipping everybody off in all of the pictures because yeah. she can't even hold up the ring. Oh, my God. Okay. So clearly a well-thought-out <sighs> wedding. So they get married. Yeah. And Roger... Like, for years, has let Jane know that, you know, fidelity, not really a thing to him. And uh, Roger is going to line up Jane with some of his friends who are polyamorous and loving their lifestyle, which is great. Super support it. Sauce. Whatever you want to (laughs) do. But Roger's like, hey, Jane, I want you to talk to them because they're going to explain how it all works. And they do. And this is how it all works, is that Roger gets to sleep with who he wants to. Sure. And Jane is 
not required, but encouraged to recruit girls that Roger may like to sleep with. Nope. To Roger. Nope. And uh, why is that her job? Sometimes we can all do it together, but sometimes that not may be what we want to do. Why can't she just be out scooping guys for herself? Well, hold on, because this is this is the best part of how this is done. I feel like you're being ironic when you use that word best. Is that Jane is totally forbidden to make love to another man. Oh, my God. This and, is not polyamory. <laughs> and Jane is like, <laughs> to your point, that's exactly it. Jane's like... Yeah, this doesn't this sound is, mm, like sexual freedom. We're just structuring your affairs here, right, hubby? <laughs> uh, but Jane, trying to be perfect and not yet discovering whole, Jane's like, okay, which is why she's like, I've done ever. I'm not I, sure. I, I, sure, okay. So, sexual freedom be damned. Jane is eventually going to start having her own affairs. Right? Because, come on. But Jane and Roger will film the cult film classic Barbarella together. I, I was wondering if he had been the mind behind that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, Jane will be carrying her first child in 1968 with a complicated pregnancy. So Jane has a lot of bed rest, which gives Jane the opportunity to sit down and watch a lot of French TV all day long about what the hell is happening in America. Hmm. And Jane's like, whoa, I'm not down with what's happening in America. And Jane will deliver her daughter, I'm Vanessa. Sorry, 1968, mm-hmm. you said? In the summer, her daughter's named Vanessa after Vanessa Redgrave. Mm. So it goes. By the late 60s, early 70s, Jane has a kid. She has severe postpartum depression. She is over the frivolous life of Roger and all of those things that attracted Jane early on are now not quite as attractive. Right. And she will, at this point, take a lover. His name is Eric Emerson. He is one of Andy Warhol's protégés in his New York factory set. That was a fun Patreon episode we did about Edie Sedgwick not yes. that long ago. Yes. Roger and Jane head out to California, where Jane... In the summer of 1969, we'll have a hot makeout sesh with Jay Sebring, the ex-lover of Sharon Tate, before she married Roman Polanski at a little party at the house on Saleo Drive. This was the summer of 1969, before August 8, which really does end that uh, particular generation. The Manson murders, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're just sliding in all kinds of stuff. Dude, it's, it, there's a lot. Spider there's Webby. a lot in this story, and it's like, I, it doesn't have to be perfect. Right. It has to be whole. So by the fall of 69. Touring the late 20th century with Jane Fonda. Right. No, she's there. She's there. She's the Forrest Gump of the late 20th century. So by the fall, like, Hollywood falls apart after this. We've talked about it a little bit in Fun With Done. Like, people are carrying guns. Gun sales shoot up. Every canyon is lit on fire. Lenny Dunn is in Joan Didion's pool when she finds out the... Like, Jane's, like, panicked. Every... This shatters everything. And by fall, Jane is making her plan. She wants to go to India. Roger, take the kid for a little while. I need to go off and find myself. Lots of feelings. She'll hook up with some Peace Corps volunteers there. And by the time she returns to Los Angeles, she will admit that this relationship she has figured out isn't where she wants to be. And she will write in one of her books, after six years, I had begun to see a faint outline of me without him. Hmm. And for anyone who's made it to the end of a relationship, isn't that the best feeling? I could see me without That's a breath of fresh air. So Jane's looking for something. (laughs) Yeah. And she's been getting involved with Native American causes, with the anti-war stuff. And she and Roger both know it's over. They're going to divorce January 16th, 1973. But they share a child. They'll remain close. They'll both remarry. She'll loan them cash. 
When Roger passes away in February of 2000, all four of those same women who were doing the ride along oh, in the ambulance God. are at his service. Reassemble. It is remarkable, really. Wow. It really is. And so we got two more husbands, friends. Jane has already met hubby number two back in Los Angeles. His name is Tom Hayden. Tom Hayden, fellow Sagittarius, he's a December 11th baby, is an activist and author and works with the SDS, the Students for Democratic Society. He and Jane have fallen in love back in 1972. So three days after her divorce from Roger is final. Take a breath, Jane. Take a breath. Jane doesn't know how to take a breath. Yeah. Like that, it's not about being perfect. Right. It's about becoming whole, right? So three days later, they will marry in Jane's home in Laurel Canyon. That July, they have a son. They will also adopt a child throughout their 17-year-long marriage. This one lasts the longest. Things are going pretty good. He runs for office. He's a congressional representative. Like, he moves through politics. She's doing the exercise thing. Left, right, left, right, yeah. double time. No, she was big. I mean, in the Huge. 80s, she was on, ever, like, you could not get away Huge. from Jane Fonda on your television in the 80s. She has the best-selling workout videotape of all time. Mm-hmm. Like, and two Oscars. Like, she... Legend. Okay. <laughs> this this is going great until da 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 Tom falls in love with someone else mm. who is not Jane. I mean it happens. We 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 as the Trashy Divorces podcast are a little grateful that it happens, but it, it is it does suck. So Tom and Jane split. They're gonna divorce in June nineteen ninety. He will marry and have another kid and that marriage for Tom and his new wife remains until his death in 2016. But this transgression, the cheat, like all of it, it breaks Jane. Jane says she has a nervous breakdown. She cannot talk above a whisper. She walks very slowly. She is, she's gutted. And again, in her drive to be perfect at this time and still not quite yet whole, I can totally understand how Southern cowboy and Scorpio man Ted Turner captures her. Jane will say Ted teaches her how to laugh. He was out there and spontaneous and wonderful and the kind of life that Ted Turner, medium mogul, multi-everything Scorpio man can provide for you. It's re- it's amazing to note that Ted Turner, CNN founder, like I, you know, whatever, uh, used to show up to like board meetings, like important mm-hmm. meetings in a Confederate general's uniform. <laughs> like, think about that in the lens of today. It's remarkable. And Jane Fonda was <laughs> his wife. Confederate uniform aside, sure. Jane's looking at Ted like, whoa, I don't have to work. You got 23 homes, 2 million acres of land, money, private planes. I can imagine coming from an almost two decade long marriage that uh, you find out that you're not the one your husband loves and has decided to bail. The comforts and security that Ted Turner might be able to provide to you would be attractive. Yeah. Yeah. I I would I would suppose that's probably true. Jane and Ted will marry on her birthday, December 21st, 1991, which is super. But one month after the wedding, Jane finds out Ted has been unfaithful and Jane is pissed and she'll smash a telephone over his Confederate uniform wearing ass head. Yeah. Yeah. So this is 1992 and Jane's 56 and for the first time she gets herself into therapy. She learns that, hey, wait a minute, I'm partially responsible, too, for the things that happen in my relationships. And maybe smashing a telephone (laughs) on your head wasn't the greatest thing that I could do. So Jane gets herself in therapy and begins to deal with all of the childhood stuff. Gets her mom's records to find out that mom has been sexually abused when she was a young girl. And, like, everything begins to, like, uh, okay, 
she deals with the childhood stuff and the guilt about mom and the distant dad and the eating disorders and the marriage and the heartbreak. And Jane is taking her first steps at 56 into becoming whole. And Ted gets in on the therapy too. So they do couples therapy for a while. And Jane's like, yep, I'm going to stick it out. And they have a marvelous time for about 10 years until, well, she discovers that he has cheated again. God. And Jane, 10 years into her own self-discovery, is out. And she talks about, at this time period, kind of being torn. On one side, there's this voice that says, I have everything I could need or want, and I can die married and incomplete. And on the other side, there's this other voice. I can be done with this and discover who I'm meant to be. Right. So, at 62... She listens to that other voice. She moves in with her daughter in Atlanta in a tiny room with no closet and her big ass dog. And Jane begins to shed that last skin and grow into something that is I, I, truly beautiful. Uh, Ted and Jane will divorce in May 2001. Jane will collect about $70 million from that settlement. So not bad. Ted and Jane remain friends. Friends of Ted's will say that Jane is the love of his life and Mm -hmm. he regrets that more than anything else. Yeah. Ted says they were the best years of his life. So this next stage of life, her third act, so to speak, begins Jane's, I do not need validation from anyone except for myself at this stage in my life. And she'll begin to act again because she quit that when she was married to Ted. She'll date again. She has a Pretty long relationship with this record producer named Richard Perry. That ends in 2017. She has dance parties with all of her friends. Oh, yeah. There's Grace and Frankie. There is. She's working with Lily Tomlin. It's funny. You should see them see uh, the end of Closer to Fine with the Indigo Girls on stage together. That was a good, good show. Oh, what else is Jane doing? Oh, yeah. Getting arrested, like, on the weekly in Washington and doing her thing, man. I just love her. So, in this story, we could go trash cans or halos. But for Jane's part, I really feel like halos are mostly in order. Maybe some trash cans for her cheating husbands, but Jane, to me, has led a life that is so heartfelt and open and an example to any person who has struggled with that need to be perfect versus need to be whole dilemma. I may be that person. Jane Fonda resonates with me. All halos on my end. It's not about being perfect. It's about being whole. I think it's a good lesson for everybody. It It is indeed a good lesson. And that is my story of the trashy divorces of Jane Fonda. All right. I know you've wanted to cover her for a long time. A long and... time. So I've got a lot of halos. We'll follow up on Roger this week and his trashy divorces because there's some amazing stories We'll talk about Jane a little bit more on Trashy Tidbits as well. But those are the trashy divorces of Jane Fonda. Whole not perfect. Yeah. And I I stand for that. Yeah, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to agree. Since there's no such thing as perfect anyway, you may as well go for something attainable like being able to self-validate and all of that. It's kind of a big deal. Yeah. Let's all get there. Let's all get there. All right, until then, let's, let's take, take a, a break. quick break and then come back with the other kinder, gentler half. The, yeah, the, the... the not trashy divorce. <laughs> of, yeah, in a very special episode of Trashy Divorces. <laughs> the non trashy divorces. Happy of... divorces. We'll be right back. Y'all, for as much as we take care of our physical and spiritual selves, taking care of your mental health just as important too. Yeah, probably never more important than right now. And there are probably things interfering with your happiness. Stacey, I have something great for our listeners. What's that? Confidential, convenient, professional, and affordable counseling through BetterHelp.com. So easy. You go to BetterHelp, take a quiz, you get assigned a therapist in less than 24 hours. No biggie. If you don't gel with that one, you can get assigned a new one. And all of the counseling takes place just right where you are. Virtually, yeah. You get to connect in a safe and private online environment, which is super convenient. This is not self-help. This is professional counseling by professional counselors. No waiting room. No bra. So easy. We want you to live happier lives today. 
So as a listener, you can get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash trashy. Trash pandas. You can join over 800,000 people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash trashy. Stacy, I'm so excited hmm. about your story this week. It's just candy. It's it's candy. Candy divorces. It's, They're not even trashy. It's just full of candy. I think this is the least trashy divorce that I've ever covered. I hope you're ready for this episode of Warming Your Heart with Stacy. I I've been waiting for Warming My Heart with Stacy for years. Let's do it. All right. <laughs> so this one really took me back to my childhood. When the Cosby show was must-watch television and Cosby's stand-up specials made it perfectly normal for my childhood friend group to randomly start chanting, Dad is great. He give us a cho- chocolate cake. cake. Yeah. yeah. If you're a kid from the 80s. Oh, like, yeah. Give us chocolate cake. Yeah, Dad is great. You can Google that clip. Um, clearly, a different time it's for- It's got eggs everyone. and milk. Flour. <laughs> it's got wheat in it. <laughs> oh. Kind of a dirt bag. Kind of. Genius. Kind of. Currently incarcerated for his dirt baggery. So, all right. We are not going to get into Bill Cosby's nightmare personal conduct today. And honestly, he's so horrifying that we may never find it in ourselves to devote a half hour to him because, but I cannot tell the story of the fairly short and extremely youthful marriage of actress and activist Lisa Bonet and rocker and actor Lenny Kravitz without mentioning that Lisa first came to prominence playing Denise Huxtable on that once venerable television show. Denise! Oh, and then the spinoff. Oh, and the spinoff. In a different different world world. with Marissa Tomei. And, oh, I never missed that show. I never, never, never missed it. And Dwayne. Oh, God. Oh, God. Yeah, man. 80s TV. All right. Love it. Before we get into our star-crossed lovers, I want to point out that these two and Lisa's current husband, Jason Momoa, are pretty much the antithesis of what Trashy Divorces is about. However, if you are maybe casting about for role models and how to handle stuff with your ex after a divorce, it'd be hard to do better than Lisa and Lenny have done. Look at us. We have modeled solo personal behavior about getting whole, not perfect, and model couple behavior this week. Yes. I dig it. And also, uh, Lisa Bonet has changed her name. Uh, oh, really? I, I will be referring to her as Lisa throughout this story. That okay. is, but she changed her name in 1995. And to? Lila Koa, I believe. Okay. Get into it. Cool. Um, seems worth mentioning that I'm using the wrong name. I'm using her her stage name at this point. Okay, perfect. Thank you for the clarification. All right. So Lenny Kravitz is the older of the pair. So we'll start with him because he you know, came into the world first. So Lenny Kravitz is a songwriter, multi-instrumentalist, singer, producer, actor, wildly successful. Talented guy. Who is the only child of actress Roxy Roker and NBC News producer Cy Kravitz. Mom, who portrayed half of TV's first interracial couple as Helen Willis on The Jeffersons. a big deal. Is black. And dad is white and Jewish, a pairing that was illegal in much of the United States when they wed in New York in 1962. And happy Loving Day week, Wow, happy, I was about to say, happy Loving Day. We celebrated that this week. Friday was Loving Day. Okay. Leonard Albert Kravitz was born a couple of years. You could just be Leonard or Albert. You got both of them. (laughs) Bless your heart. (laughs) Uh, So he was born on May 26th, 1964. He's a Gemini. Oh, Gemini boy. And uh, a quick word about his name. He was named for his uncle, Leonard M. Kravitz. Uncle Leonard had died at the age of 19 fighting in the Korean War. Oh, wow. Um, His unit's position was overrun by enemy forces the night of March 6th, 1951. Leonard took over for the machine gunner when the machine gunner got hit. Shouted for everybody to get the hell out of there. Ignored an order to retreat, provided cover fire, and saved... Leonard the Thompson Gunner. Tons of lives. Oh my gosh. At the cost of his own. Wow. So here's what sucks, though. Leonard Kravitz, as noted, was Jewish, and it was the custom of the military Uh, at the time to exclude Jewish, Black, and Hispanic soldiers from consideration for the Medal of Honor. That is shameful. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This is the highest award that the United States gives for valor in battle. Um, 
So Leonard gets the second highest award, the Distinguished Service Cross, posthumously, because he was killed. Um, so his friends and family and the families of other Jewish, Black, and Hispanic service members spent the next 63 years what? fighting to get him properly awarded the Medal of Honor. The 63 years it worked. 2014. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Shameful. Okay. So anyway, Private First Class Leonard M. Kravitz and 23 others were um, awarded the Medal of Honor that year, having been overlooked for racism. Okay. Obama? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, he was. He was the president then. Um, so Lenny Kravitz has some pretty huge shoes to fill. He was on hand for the service. Um, That's fantastic. Mm-hmm. Young Lenny, the one who would marry Lisa Bonet later, was musical from the start. And coming from a successful and creative family, they nurtured that interest. He knew early on that he would be a musician, and he learned drums and guitar. His dad, again a news producer, moonlighted as a jazz promoter. Of so, course he did. Of course he did. So as a kid, Lenny's hanging out with Count Basie, Ella Fitzgerald, Miles Davis. Wow. Duke Ellington played him uh, happy birthday at uh, his fifth birthday party. No. He saw the Jacksons at Madison Square Garden when he was seven. Loved the music coming out of Motown artists like Stevie Wonder, Aretha, Gladys, like the whole thing. I mean, it was, it sounds like he had a very magical childhood in New York City. And then his mother was cast in the Jeffersons and they had to move to California. Oh, so he's 10, I guess, and uh, joins the California Boys Choir. So he's, you know, he's playing instruments at home, developing his voice. Um, I'm always just, I'm amazed at kids who are that cooked that early. Because there are, like, I floated through what the hell I wanted to do forever. Yeah, you're not There kidding. are some people who just come out like, this is, this is what I'm going to do. And this is, this is what I have to do. That yeah. is amazing. So he also discovered rock and roll in California. And so his teen years were the Stones and Led Zepp, Sabbath, CCR, Kiss, The Who, Pink Floyd. Like, he's getting this really rounded... You, you two hear really it. good scenes to pick up oh, on. Oh, yeah. Dude. You hear yeah. it in his, in his wow. own art. Like, he gets this very well-rounded exposure to... Musical education. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. 78, he's accepted into Beverly Hills High School's music program. Um, he learned piano and bass guitar and met a drummer named Zorro, who would become a friend and collaborator. In 1985, his parents' marriage broke up mm. and he took that pretty hard. Um, he kind of like he left home when he was 15. He just couldn't. I think it was I think there was probably just a lot of stuff going on tension in mm-hmm. the house and he he's i mean he's a sensitive artist guy so he told rolling Jim and I soul yeah he was out he told rolling stone in 1995 that for a while during this period there was this cheap car rental place in la where you could rent a used pento for 4.99 a day perfect so he was living out of a rented pento wow and you know he had his like guitar and some clothes in the back and i i don't know if he actually ever graduated from high school He clearly had other stuff going on. Clearly. That's a bargain. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Five bucks a day. Yeah. Yeah. He did some odd jobs. He sold shoes. He washed dishes in a restaurant, whatever. He's writing and playing music. As we know, one thing about marketers, what a marketer likes is finding a thing that's a lot like other things that they already know how to market. (laughs) And this is a problem if you're a black artist making art that is not clearly black art. So, because Lenny Kravitz has this sound that's really infused with, you know, Led Zeppelin and like, yeah, so the the record labels kept rejecting him because they couldn't easily pigeonhole him. You know, right, if you... We can't define your sound, If Lenny man. Kravitz had walked in trying to have a career as an R&B singer or whatever, like, that, like, those marketing whizzes would have been like, oh, we can, we can yeah, do we this. can we do can this. We can make you gospel. We can, yeah. So, yeah, I think he just, like, you know, his family blew up and he he was having i think it was very frustrating this sort of mid 80s period there was one glaringly bright spot to help him through oh tell me i love some sunshine so we're gonna 
park young Mr. Kravitz here at the Trashy Divorces Sound Studio and Used Car Emporium for a minute. I was about to say he's in the Pinto. Just going to leave him there in the so Pinto for a minute. Gonna park the Pinto outside so, so that we can meet his soon-to-be wife, Lisa Bonet. Lisa was born November 16th, 1967. Scorpio girl. She is a Scorpio oh. girl in San Francisco. Never um, just an ordinary girl. No. Also a biracial child. Mom was a white Jewish music teacher. Dad was an African-American opera singer from Texas. Really? Talk about like, if you have that on your bingo card, <laughs> Texas. Didn't see that coming. The Texas part is what really sealed it for me. Like <laughs> Opera singing cowboy. <laughs> yes. Anyway, I think they split up when she was pretty young, and I think she and her mom relocated to Los Angeles. Okay. So, as a kid, she did some pageants. It's L.A., and she's beautiful, so, like, there were some TV commercials, and there was a little, like, a few spots here and there as a child actor before being cast as Denise Huxtable in 1984, when she was about 16. Life-changing. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I'm sure she... Is still pulling royalty checks in from that, right? I would hope so. Okay, so she was already famous when she meets this nobody aspiring musician guy backstage at a New Edition concert. And for a couple of years, they were just tight friends. Uh -uh, A New Edition show? Mm -hmm. Oh my God. That's so cute. Yep. I Um, said it. (laughs) (laughs) So, like, they got to be good friends. They were roommates for a while. And this sort of led to a blooming of interesting these are two of the most beautiful people on the planet like some things are just bound to happen if you're in a room for long enough (laughs) okay huh all right so this led them to romance which led them to eloping in las vegas on lisa's 20th birthday wow november 16 1987 lenny was 23 so really young right and he's still a nobody so he he told uh, Rolling Stone after the divorce, she was like a female version of me. We were complete mirror images of each other. It was unbelievable. Lisa was doing her Cosby show and people called me Mr. Bonet and I didn't care at all. That woman inspired me so much. It was a magical time that she and I shared. I just opened up artistically. Forget the Cosby show and all that. The woman is ridiculously creative. So he was Mr. Bonet for quite a while, right? Okay, hang tight though. Mm-hmm. Can I just tell you uh-huh. that him with a May 26th birthday is in the Taurus Gemini cusp. So there may be some of that opposing sign Taurus Scorpio thing going on. I know you think I'm full of woo. Uh, you but are. That's what I. Uh, you are is, full of. You are inarguably full of woo. That is that kind of powerful relationship that I'd be curious to see where Lenny lands on that side of the Zodiac because of. The Taurus Scorpio pool. Unimportant. Please continue. Indeed, while Lenny was being pushed off by record execs, he decided his best move was to record an album on his own. Well, sure. And Lisa has a couple of co-writing credits on what would become his debut album, Let Love Rule. (laughs) Nice. She would also Uh... direct the video for the title song. Again, pretty sure she's still getting royalty checks (laughs) for the co-writing credits there. What is the title song, Let Love Rule? Mm -hmm. You know what? Maybe we need to rename our up. We had it, Are You Gonna Go My Way? But I think Let Love Rule is a really good message for today. Perfect. Switch that up when you get to that part of it. Awesome. Will do. In the middle of all of this, Cosby fame and its spinoff A Different World, Lenny really connecting with his own creativity, they had a baby, Zoe Kravitz, who is Most now beautiful child ever born. No kidding. And like <laughs> she is on like a rocket ship to superstardom as an actress right now. Like completely. Yeah. Her I think COVID has maybe delayed because the Batman movie comes out next year in theory, but production is stalled for the pandemic. Mm. Um but she's about to basically be an action hero. It's amazing. <laughs> okay. I digress. So she's born December 1st, 1988. Lisa was definitely bristling under Bill Cosby's creative dictatorship during this period. She would tell an interviewer years later, there was no knowledge on my part about his specific actions, but there was just energy. And that type of sinister shadow energy can't be concealed. Mm. So Cosby refused to write her pregnancy with Zoe into the Cosby show. 
And Lisa openly defied her, you know, her TV dad in public when she posed topless for Interview Magazine. Cosby had expressly forbidden that. Uh, and then, oh, like you're a good moral judge, oh, character yeah. Oh, yeah. man. Oh yeah. Uh, and then she appeared in the movie Angel Heart opposite Mickey Rourke. Oh, I forgot about yeah, that. There's a very explicit sex scene, and she was 18. Like it was, it was definitely a little transgressive move. Um, these days, though, this is how Lisa reflects on that period. I don't need to say I told you so. I mm-hmm. just leave all that to karma and justice and what will be. <laughs> Boom. Okay. Boom. Lenny, meanwhile, had an old friend shopping his new nearly completed record to the labels. And finally, the marketing whizzes of the music world understood the possibilities before them in Lenny Kravitz, who was then, he was calling himself Romeo Blue for some reason. Okay. <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the 80s oh, and the, the 80s. 90s. Oh, the oh. 80s. So Virgin Records signed him in January 89. Had him drop the Romeo Blue thing. <laughs> And when Let Love Rule was released that fall, it it did very well. It was apparently a monster hit in Europe, even more than here. But, I mean, he just, I remember he just exploded onto the scene. Exploded. Mm -hmm. Slight problem. Oh, no. And one that will have a weird echo uh, in his life years later. Madonna, who is a renowned collector of things that are beautiful, was one of Lenny's early fans and collaborators. So he produced Justify My Love which is a song he'd co-written for her 1990 Immaculate Collection record. Really? The the video, I don't think he was involved in the video, but the video was so explicit that MTV banned it, which ended up being a total coup. I mean, I'm sure this was done on purpose because they sold it in record stores and moved half a million copies like that. (laughs) I mean, it was just, it's Madonna, man. You You cannot separate her. material success okay justify my success there were rumors Mm -hmm. about lenny and madonna oh and in 1991 he and he and lisa separated oh so he's always denied that there was an affair but history does record that in 1993 the marriage of lenny kravitz and lisa bonet had ended in divorce What's remarkable about the pair of them is that they affirmatively chose to continue to love each other and their daughter, even broken up, always. So Lenny told Rolling Stone, I was in a tremendous amount of pain when we broke up. Tremendous. For like six months, I only slept for two hours a day from 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. The rest of the time, I was just up like a zombie. I was floored. God, breakups suck. Mm Mm-hmm. Lisa says that she went through, quote, a very accelerated time spiritually and intellectually. Um, So I think because her father was not much in the picture when she was little, um, I think that's what she says. I didn't want to pass on those heirlooms and this fresh wound of a divorce. I think there are probably times when these thresholds can either sink you or you can see who you are and rise and dust yourself off. Ah, You don't have to be perfect. Just about being a whole. whole. Mm -hmm. So Lisa has spent the last 25 years or so living on five acres in Topanga Canyon. Really? About an hour outside of LA with a huge menagerie of animals. Oh, (laughs) including This is amazing. Including a couple of wolf mixes and a donkey that she takes on daily walks through town. Apparently, that's just something that you see. Probably not weird at all in Topanga Canyon. (laughs) It's probably not that weird. Um, She has continued acting a bit, but I honestly think she finds it kind of tedious and just derives more satisfaction out of other areas of her life royalty checks rolling in man we're fine particularly i think her family is a source of i I just she strikes me as somebody who's basically a homebody i mean she's probably i imagine her home is quite beautiful and like very her and jason momoa now but right like i i just I don't think she actually has that much of a need for the world outside. He's just the nicest guy. And oh, yeah. She, I, I love every bit of this story. She went so far, here we go, as to legally change her name to Lila Coe Moon. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, in 1995, to create more distance from her time as a Hollywood star. Interesting. Okay. She told the New York Times that the Topanga Canyon home was, quote, a retreat from a world that I was probably unprepared for at the age I was out there playing in it. For sure. Sounds right. Yeah. 
The location also let Lisa mother Zoe in a very particular way. This was before social media would have been a distraction, but even so, they didn't have cable television. Zoe had to make do with a VCR and a collection of videos like Freaky Friday and the Little Rascals that her mom kept around for her to watch. Hey, Freaky Friday oh, yeah. stands up. <laughs> I will Jodie Foster stand for her any day. Oh, also, candle shoe. That's all I have to say. Okay, but meanwhile, dad has homes in Miami, Paris, New York City, and is a bona fide rock star. He's a rock star. So when Zoe's 11, she's like, you know what, Mom? I love our dusty little patch of donkey feeding ground. But it's fun to walk the donkey to the grocery store every day. I think I'd like to go live with Dad. Does Dad have cable? Dad has cable. <laughs> Dad has a private chef. Dad has TVs in every room. Dad, right. Dad's a rock Dad's star. Dad's a rock star. Okay. Yeah, apparently this sparked very little drama between the parents. I'm sure. I'm sure it was tough for Mom, but... I don't know. They've just decided, like, we're going to raise a great kid. So whatever. That is some committed parenting. I like it. Yeah. So um, Zoe would summer with mom in Topanga and then go back to Lux Urban Living. I've missed you, donkey. And <laughs> and Lux Urban Living and sitting with the Spice Girls at the Grammys. Yeah, as Zoe Lenny's Spice. Uh -huh, yeah. Because this is the period during which... Lenny won four consecutive Best Male Rock Vocal Performance Grammys from 99 to 02. Amazing. He holds the record for the most wins in that category, as well as most consecutive wins in any category by a male artist. Really? Like, mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, he's, it's just, what's so funny, though, is that Zoe's acting career, she may well end up being the most famous of all of these people <laughs> before remarkable. it's all said and done. Like. I don't know. So in 2005, Lisa met another not yet famous person who happened to be significantly younger than her, 13 years. Really? Jason Momoa. Huh. Mutual friends introduced them at a jazz club, and it turns out that Lisa Bonet had been Jason's poster on the wall as a kid. No. He loved her. This is he, a poster on the wall that works mm -hmm, out? That works out. <gasps> works out beautifully. I hear the glass shattering. In the trash candy halls of yeah. fame right now. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he had a crush on her from the time he was 11 or something. It, yeah. After the jazz club, they stopped at a cafe for what I think is the best first date meal I've ever heard of. Guinness and grits. In. I'm 100%. So done. So are they. 100%. Oh, I love this love story. Yeah, that was that. She told Porter Magazine, in that moment, love came and it came big. And he did not run, as I think a lot of men do. He basically picked me up and threw me over his shoulder caveman style. <laughs> Just a trope in romance novels. It's Jason Momoa. I mean, I'm fine with that. <laughs> it's cool. Uh, so they have two kids together. Zoe has her half-sibling's names tattooed on her fingers. Aww. Lenny's very close to Lisa and Jason and their kids. It's really, I mean... All he, candy, no trash. Yeah, he tours a lot, so... I don't know. Like, I don't know how day-to-day -day involved he is, but it, it does seem like he's, it's almost like he's a stepdad to Jason's kids in the same way that Jason is a stepdad to his kid. No, this is the, the most whole family. It's really, yeah. Uh, Lenny himself has had prominent relationships in the years since, including with Vanessa Paradis, Adriana Lima, and Nicole Kidman. Somehow I didn't really? know that had happened. They were engaged. Um, but he's, oh, wow. Yeah, he's not remarried. He just continues to be a super cool dude who's part of a super cool family making super cool music and playing Cinna in the Hunger Games movies. What? Why not? <laughs> so to wrap up, oh, so the Madonna Echo story. Okay, so Lenny and Lisa may have specifically broken up because of Madonna's interest in Lenny, although I think really they just married really young he got very suddenly famous, like she was struggling with the Cosby dictatorship of her life. Whatever. I don't know. Madonna may have played a role. Years later, Madonna would allegedly have another fling with very beautiful and very married New York Yankee Alex Rodriguez. Oh, yeah. Current boy toy of Jennifer Lopez. Yeah. So much. We did cover Madonna in the past. I 
don't remember how much of this part we told. I think there was a little bit. This was in 08, and A-Rod was a tabloid fixture in New York already with headlines like Stray Rod <laughs> following <laughs> him <laughs> after he'd been photographed with an exotic dancer. Oh, hmm. my. So... 2008, A-Rod is spotted coming and going from Madonna's apartment at all hours, and the crowd goes wild. Yikes on bikes. A-Rod's now ex-wife, um, but wife at the time, Cynthia, had no appetite for the tabloids and had two very young, like one was a baby. One had been born like two months before this happened. Mm. Two little daughters hops a plane to Paris where word got out that she was staying with Lenny Kravitz no. at his Paris house. <sighs> Well, like you do. Which, I'm going to go hang out with my buddy Lenny K. Yeah, I have yeah. no idea how they know each other. It's This is all very so weird. So they weren't having any kind of liaison. Well, it the was... speculation was that, oh, he's he's sleeping with Madonna and she's sleeping with Lenny Kravitz. What a weird oh. world. And poor Lenny Kravitz. Like, I have no inside knowledge of this, but I, I do kind of believe she just wanted to get herself and her kids out of the glare of A-Rod setting his family on fire. <laughs> like, So poor Lenny has to put out a press statement to quash the rumors. So like, picture it, Madonna was implicated in the demise of his own marriage. And then as she put the last nail in the coffin of another guy's marriage, Lenny has to defend his own honor and that of a friend who is currently being cheated on in a very public way with Madonna. This is like a trash <laughs> candy so- collision. Yes. Wow. So, anyway. Holy cow. As far as I know, um, Cynthia is doing very well these oh, days. Oh, good for her. <laughs> and uh, A-Rod is a wholly owned subsidiary of J-Lo. <laughs> Don't quite know what to... She has such a weird impact on the men she dates and marries. Okay. So... Coming to a future episode Coming to a future of episode. Trashy Divorces. Okay. That is my not trashy divorce story this week that was amazing it is my great pleasure to award zero trash cans to america's coolest blended family and just share that i love the love that lisa lenny jason and their three children share have we ever awarded zero trash cans before Mm, i don't think so first first in the history of trashy divorces zoe has a hugely successful acting career is currently starring in a hulu original version of a gender flipped high fidelity Oh, wow. Which is even cooler because her mother was in the original High uh-huh. Fidelity movie in 2000 with John Cusack. Spider webs. Yeah, and Zoe seems on track to break out for realsies next year when she will star as Selena Kyle slash Catwoman opposite Robert Pattinson's Bruce Wayne in The Batman. Meow. COVID delays pending. This just seems like an endless supply of Halos situation. I love it. Where everybody has given everybody else... Just exactly the right amount of space and support to live their best lives. So congrats to everybody involved. (laughs) Whole not perfect, y'all. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Okay, well, this was a kinder, gentler, trashy divorces this week, and I approve. Yeah, I'm so glad. It's been a hard week. I, I, I I love this episode. I've been furiously Googling to see if, like, Zoe has said any unkind things about either of her parents in the press, and I couldn't find them. I've never seen them. Mm -mm. So... And she's amazing. To uh, she is an incredible actress. So, very cool. All the halos, zero trash cans. What a week! Also, well done because she's part of the DC universe. So is Jason Momoa, Aquaman. So it's entirely possible that she will end up co-starring with her stepfather in a huge budget Wowza. action movie in the years ahead. I love it. <laughs> it's amazing. And that is Trashy Divorces. Well done, Stacey. Thanks. Hey, you know what's exciting? Tell me. We are on episode 11 of season six, and you know what that means? Next week, free for all. Next week, hostess choice. And I'm really excited. I've only told one person what I had planned on doing. Mm -hmm. Gerald, I'm sorry. I'm switching it up. I'm going to start with that because it is oft listener requested was season seven when we come back. But next week, I'm doing something else that actually has to relate with the story today. I just decided. I wasn't decided until I came in because my whole big bit was, 
ooh, we're not drawing from cups this week because it's host choice. But during this episode, I decided who I was going to do, who I've wanted to do for a long time. Down with the tyranny of the cups. No, I like it. Um, I have <laughs> We're going to get back to the cups yeah. next season. So be sure to continue sending us your trashy divorces ideas. We've got something, I think a little fun plan for next season that we'll tell you about next week. Until then, be sure to tune in to... What's that bit.ly link again, Stacey? Ah, uh, bit.ly slash trash candy quarantine, where we've pulled out Patreon content from behind the paywall for you. Stuff happening there. Ooh, also this week on Patreon, I can give a few secret drops about what's coming. We're going to do this fun thing on tutors and medieval medicine, which is, whoa. We'll be following up on Roger Vadim and his trashy divorces as well. And there's another special surprise for our trash candy connoisseurs. So if you need more trash candy in your life, if you want to get involved in the trash candy universe, you can go to patreon.com slash trashy divorces mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and check us out or get a little for taste. Hundreds of hours of additional trash candy over there. So much trash candy. Yeah. It's the best piles and piles. Hey everybody. Thank you for tuning in this week. Your time in this world is precious. We appreciate you spending it with us. Hmm true story you know what should uh what should our dear trash pandas do oh my gosh first of all wash your hands aggressively clean hands trashy heart Mm -hmm. but until we see you again you should always keep it keep it trashy y'all big cheers friends (laughs) Bye. bye trash pandas thanks for listening trashy divorces is written and produced by us stacy and alicia for hemlock creatives you can contact us at trashydivorces at gmail.com. Our art is by Sydney V. Smith, Sydney V. Smith at carbonmade.com. And our music is used with permission of Ratsy. You can find her at Ratsy Store on Instagram. Check out episode sources, photos, soundtracks, merch store, and more at trashydivorces.com. Need more trash candy? Our Patreon community includes some of the bestest humans around, as well as a bunch of bonus content every week. Join the fun at patreon.com slash trashy divorces. Last but not least, come play with us on social. We are at trashy divorces at Instagram, which Alicia mostly runs. Twitter, which Stacy mostly runs. And on Facebook, which, which we split. We, split. <laughs> we also have a trashy divorces discussion group on Facebook. If you want to chat with other trashy divorces listeners. Thanks again for listening. Keep Keep it it trashy, trashy, y'all.